Parenting Junkie. Hi guys and welcome back to the Parenting Junkie, the place to go to love parenting and for parenting from love. And talking of places to go, today I wanted to talk to you about the idea of global parenting, okay? Um, now, what this idea is, is basically the fact that, especially today, when we have such access to amazing information from all around the world, we can draw inspiration from parenting philosophies from all over. Now, of course, this has its pros and its cons because it can be very confusing when we're not rooted in a deep cultural approach to parenting that it becomes a no-brainer. We just do what our parents did and what our aunts and uncles and cousins are doing. Uh, it can be really confusing. We're opening up a whole array of practices and ideas and philosophies and often they're completely conflicting. So we don't really know what is the best. How do we raise the happiest, healthiest, most amazing children? On the other hand, it's so liberating. It's so liberating to see that around the world and throughout history, people have raised children in so vastly different ways and different cultures have achieved different types of success through different parental behaviors. So in many ways, for me at least, I take this as an exciting thing. I take it as exciting to think that different cultures are doing different things and I can kind of pick and choose what works for me. I don't have to be bound by my geography. And at the end of this video, I'm going to share with you what kind of cultural ideas I've taken from different cultures and how they affect my home, even living in the US today. Now, I personally have lived on three different continents, so I have personally experienced lots of different cultures uh, when it comes to raising children. But even if you haven't, just having an internet connection, which you clearly have if you're watching this video, allows you to learn a lot about what is normal, what is considered normal um, in different parts of the world. Now, it even goes as far as what childhood development is considered normal, um, which can really set our mind at ease. This isn't to say that one culture is right and another culture is wrong when it comes to these practices. Although a lot of psychological research can tease apart these behaviors and see what it results in. Are these children more independent? Are they happier? Do they have less anxiety and depression? Do they have longer lasting relationships? Do they make more money? You know, however you want to measure success, you can actually see what types of practices bring about that success. Take breastfeeding, for example. In many places in the US, what I often see is that there's a shame of, around breastfeeding, that it is an embarrassing thing to do in public, that you need to hide in the bathroom or pump at home, and there's a very common feeling amongst mothers that they don't have enough milk and that they can't breastfeed for a long time and that by the time their kids are three months old they've got to um, supplement or just move all the way over to formula feeding. Whereas in most countries around the world, children breastfeed until they're two, three, even four, and in some places five, six, and seven. And that's considered perfectly normal. Whereas I know that in the culture that I'm in in the US, that would be considered perverse, disgusting, worrying, but entire countries raise their children that way and they're happy with it. So what does that say about our cultural assumption that breastfeeding should only go till one years old? Another idea that I come across often in the US or in places that I've grown up in is that children should stay inside when it's cold. Well, look at Norway, for example, that has one of the most freezing climates on the planet. And there it is very strongly culturally accepted that children should be spending most of their time outdoors, most particularly tiny babies and their naps. So they will bundle them up warm and nap them outside. Now that's something that I think the neighbors might call social services for if they saw me doing in New York. Something I know they would call the police about would be leaving my baby in a stroller on the street outside a shop while I went in to do my shopping or outside a restaurant while I went in to have my lunch. But that is what happens in Denmark on a regular basis. Another example like that is that Japanese kids go out by themselves from very young ages. Four-year-olds go out with seven-year-olds, they take the subway, they go to the corner store, they buy what they need. They're incredibly independent. That is something that would never happen in New York. Another thing that happens in Japan that does not happen in the US is that kids co-sleep with their parents, or certainly until their preteen years, until they're about eight, nine, 10, kids are sleeping in the same bed as the adults. And that's just considered a child's right. Same goes for Scandinavia, where babies and kids co-sleep with their parents because it's considered a child's right to have access to their parent and access to their bodies. Whereas in the US, I have a four month old baby and all I hear is, is she in her own bed yet? Is she in her own room? Is she letting you sleep through the night? 
And then contrast that to France, where if your baby's not sleeping through the night at two weeks, you're worried. Why is your baby still needing you at night? So you see, there are so many different approaches and so much of them is culturally rooted. Not necessarily what's best for kids, just what that culture assumes is best for children. Take another example, which is how much we should push our kids for success, how much we should get them to achieve. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like in the US we have a very strong urge to push our kids to the next goal and the next goal and achievement and achievement. Kind of like a mini resume building from the age of zero. Whereas in Holland, for example, they're very concerned about not pushing kids because they're going to be miserable. They'll have all these achievements and PhDs, but will they be happy people? So instead, the Dutch are very focused on having just a pleasant environment for their kids, scheduled rest time, the right food, and that type of thing. And speaking of the right food, consider the difference between America and France. In France, there is no snacking. There are three meals a day and one snack for most families, that's how it goes. And kids don't get kids food, there is no kids menu. They eat what the parents eat and they're strongly encouraged and taught to appreciate all the different types of French cuisine. Whereas in America, what I'm seeing a lot is if it's not white and processed, then kids are not going to want to eat it because they've been taught that that's kids food. And of course, this list could go on and on. Around the world, the approach to education differs vastly. In some places, a more democratic approach is favoured, where kids get licensed to take charge of their own education through play, through multi-age groups, and through exploration. Whereas in other parts of the world, a very institutionalised approach to education takes place, where standardised curriculum is the norm. So what's the bottom line with all of this? Well, for me, the bottom line is that it's interesting. It's interesting to educate ourselves about the differences in parenting so that we can release ourselves from the little box that we've been boxed into by our culture. When we believe that whatever our culture does just is the right way or is what kids need, then we're closing ourselves off to options and ideas that come from other cultures that we can learn from. This doesn't mean that we have to dislike the culture that we're living in. It just means that we don't have to take it as a complete package. We can pick apart the good from the bad and choose what we do resonate with and what we don't. And when you see that there are millions of people in other countries behaving the way you're behaving with your kids, that normalizes it for you and gives you validation in your parenting choices. So of course our intuition is important and of course what we get from our culture is important, but we have this outside source of inspiration for par parenting ideas that we can use. Okay, so I promised I would share with you some examples of how my own personal parenting approach and style develops and changes with cultural influences that I've learned about from different countries than the countries that I live in. One great example for this is elimination communication or diaper free. This is the idea that I have learned from many, many cultures around the world that babies don't have to wear diapers, that they cue and signal when they need to go to the potty and that you can potty train a baby by one years old or certainly by two. This is something that comes in contrast to the culture that I live in, but I received this kind of gift, this knowledge through the internet and through books that I read and through people that I've met from those cultures. And that validates my choice as in fact something that millions of people do, just not the people that happen to be around me. And just really briefly, some other things that we like to take from other cultures. Well, we really like to take the approach that Sweden, Denmark, Finland have to play. Play is something that we consider to be the most important work and pastime of childhood, much more than achieving or learning certain things. We see play as the achievement, as the learning tool in our home. So we kind of sanctify play um, in a way that we haven't seen done in the culture around us, but we've seen done in other cultures. I've spoken in other videos about our approach to food, to bedtime, and certainly to discipline. And that's something that I can safely say has probably been very affected by other cultures as well. I also want to recommend three particularly favorite books on this subject that open your mind to other cultures and how they parent. One is Parenting Without Borders from Christine Grosslow. And this is just a great personal story about Christine Grosslow's life in Tokyo, in France, and in America, and raising her children in all these places. Another great account is Bringing Up Bebe, which is all about French parenting. And lastly, the continuum concept, which is about parenting styles in the South American jungle. 
I would love to hear where in the world are you from? What kind of parenting styles do you accept from your culture and what styles do you reject? What makes you feel like an insider and what makes you feel like an outsider? And what have you borrowed from other countries that is serving you in your parenting at home? So head on over to theparentingjunkie.com and leave me a comment now about your parenting culture and what you're borrowing from other cultures. I love to hear from you. And of course, subscribe to the channel here on YouTube. Keep on loving parenting and parenting from love because your kids need you almost as much as you need them. Bye.